Grace and peace to you in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And welcome today to The Vine, the online campus of the Wrightsville United Methodist Church. I hope that you all had a wonderful Thanksgiving celebration. I'm Pastor David Haley, one of the associate pastors here at Wrightsville United Methodist. And it's my joy to welcome you to this online worship service today. Uh, we're so glad that you're joining us for worship on this first Sunday of Advent. Please use the QR code uh, that will appear on the screen in a moment or the link that's in the video description to register your attendance with us, your participation, and also uh, you can let us know of any prayer requests that you may have. Once again, welcome to this worship service and let us now prepare our hearts and minds for worship. I invite you to join with me now as we pray together in unison our opening congregational prayer. The words will be scrolled across the screen. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have taught us that the night is far spent and the day is at hand. Grant that we may always be found watching for the coming of your Son. You so loved the world that you gave your only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Grant us, we humbly pray, the precious gift of faith, that we may know that the Son of God has come into the world. Help us to feel your presence with us always. And may our lives show in every word and deed your great love for the world. We confess that we are not always willing to see the light and to walk in your ways. We have not always opened our eyes to the needs of others. We ask that the Spirit of Christ be born anew within us, that our hearts may be stirred to glorify the birth of Jesus with words of witness and acts of compassion and service. Through Jesus our Lord we pray. Amen. I'll be reading from the book of Isaiah, chapter 60, verses 2 and 3. For darkness shall cover the earth, and thick darkness the peoples. But the Lord will arise upon you, and his glory will appear over you. <clears throat> Nations shall come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your dawn. We light this symbol, this candle, as a symbol of Christ, our hope. May the light sent from God shine in the darkness to show us the way of salvation. O come, O come. Emmanuel. And find the quiet center in the crowded life we lead. Find the room for hope to enter. Find the frame where we are free. Clear the chaos and the clutter. Clear our eyes that we can see. All the things that really matter. Be at peace and simply be.
children as now as days of old we are waiting for the coming of the lord we are waiting for the coming of the lord my god with a faith in a glorious reward faith in a star that soon will light the earth we are waiting for the coming of the lord Thoughts of a chill night in Palestine of old, so much as it is today. Pray for the child that shivers in the cold. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord, my God, with the faith in a glorious reward. Faith in a star that soon will light the earth. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord, my God, with the faith in a glorious reward. Faith in a star that soon will light the earth. We are waiting for the coming of the Lord. We are waiting for the coming. I'm going to lead us in the morning prayer. It's my great privilege to do so. And as I pray, I will be pausing at a certain point in the prayer to give you the opportunity to speak the names of persons that you would like to remember in prayer, especially today. Let us pray together. God of love and mercy, thank you for the great gift of your Son, Jesus Christ, who fills us with all that we need. Merciful God, we are fully aware that not all your children are able to rest in joy or peace 
during this season. We pray that during this season of Advent, we may usher your promise of salvation into our lives and that we may share the good news of our Savior with others. We pray that the promise of your birth may be the promise that we live in and share at home, at work, and at school. May we be moved to compassion and action in your name. We pray today for those suffering and in need, physically, mentally, and spiritually. We especially pray for these whom we now name with our voices or in our hearts. Hear our prayers, O Lord. We pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ, who taught us all to pray using these words, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. I invite us now to enter into a time of reflection on our Christian stewardship. And we're reminded that our stewardship is rooted in God's promise of blessing. Promises that we see fulfilled every single day. We give back to God out of gratitude for our blessings. You, should, you can worship God by giving offerings at a live worship service or by mailing checks to Wrightsville United Methodist Church, P.O. Box 748, Wrightsville Beach, North Carolina. You can also give through our church webpage and also through our church cell phone app. Let us now reflect on the opportunity we have to be good stewards of God's gifts.
Brooksville kids. I'm Pastor Julia. And right now I'm home at my parents' house in Ohio. And I'm helping to put away some of our Thanksgiving decorations and put out our Christmas decorations. So we're gonna pack up these little pumpkins that we used for the fall. And then we're gonna put out some things like this awesome plant that reminds us of Christmas. Maybe you are decorating this weekend or helping your parents do that. I love decorations because they remind us what season we're in and they help us to celebrate and be excited. Did you know that at the church we use decorations too? Inside the church, we have different banners and fabrics that remind us what time of year it is and help us to celebrate. This Sunday at the church, we're starting a season called Advent. And Advent is the season that comes right before Christmas. It's when we're getting really, really excited for baby Jesus to come. That's what Advent means, coming or arrival. So we use colors like purple. Do you have any idea why we might use purple? We use purple because it's the color that kings and royalty used to wear. So when we cover things in purple, we remember that Jesus is our king who's coming. We also have an advent wreath, and this helps us each week to remember where we are, to light one candle and then two the next week, then three and then four, which means it's almost Christmas. These are fun decorations that help us to celebrate and get excited for Jesus' coming. So this year, when you see on the screen or in the building those purple cloths and that Advent wreath, I want you to remember that those help us celebrate Jesus' coming. Let's say a prayer. God, thank you so much for sending Jesus Help us to get excited and ready for Jesus' arrival. We love you, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning. It is the first Sunday of Advent. And I'm so glad that you took the time to watch the vine with us here at Wrightsville United Methodist Church. Our scripture for today and throughout this season will be from the prophet Isaiah, who prophesies about the Messiah. And so let's hear what he has to say today. We're in chapter 9, beginning in verse 2. The people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. Those who lived in a land of deep darkness, on them light has shined. You have multiplied the nation, you have increased its joy. They rejoice before you as with joy at the harvest, as people exult when dividing plunder. For the yoke of their burden and the bar across their shoulders, the rod of their oppressor you've broken as on the day of Midian. For all the boots of the trampling warriors and all the garments rolled in blood shall be burned as fuel for the fire. For a child has been born for us, a son given to us. Authority rests upon his shoulders. And he is named Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, Everlasting Father, Prince of Peace. His authority shall grow continually, and there shall be endless peace for the throne of David and his kingdom. He will establish and uphold it with justice and with righteousness from this time onward and forevermore. The zeal of the Lord of hosts will do this. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Almighty and everlasting God, I pray that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all our hearts be acceptable in your sight, for you are our strength and our Redeemer. Amen. Well, as I mentioned, it's the first Sunday of Advent. We've put the great holiday of Thanksgiving behind us. We've started putting up our Christmas decorations, and we've probably even started shopping for Christmas presents to give to our loved ones. One of the many Christmas tra traditions that we all treasure is the singing of Christmas carols. And if you grew up in church, you probably memorized the words of five or six without even thinking about it. Because many of our carols come from merry old England, some of the ancient words and ideas they use can sometimes seem unfamiliar to small children. 
I ran across a list of some often misunderstood verses from famous Christmas carols. I wonder if you can recognize these songs. Oh, what fun it is to ride with one horse, soap, and hay. I don't think that's how that goes. Or he's making a list, chicken and rice. No, that's not it either. On the first day of Christmas, my tulip gave to me. In the meadow, we can build a snowman and pretend that he is sparse and brown. Or my favorite, Noel, Noel, Barney's the king of Israel. Just in case you might be confused on this point, we do not recognize Barney the purple dinosaur as the king of Israel. Instead, Advent is a time to prepare for the coming of Jesus, the true king of Israel, the word made flesh, the light of the world, the Messiah. You know, I'm amazed at the things people can do nowadays with photos. I I see commercials for this all the time on TV. You know, you can crop and contrast and filter and frame, enhance, brighten, and Photoshop pictures to make them look so much better than the pictures that I grew up with. But there are some limits. An employee at a Photoshop shared a story of a particularly challenging customer one time. The woman brought in a weathered picture of her great-grandfather milking a cow. She was so eager to know what her great-grandfather looked like, but the cow was in the way. So the woman had great faith that the Photoshop could solve her problem. Can you move the cow? She asked. The clerk tried to explain that this was impossible. No, just move the cow over and we'll be able to see my great-grandfather's face. The woman refused to believe that her request could not be fulfilled. She left the shop in disgust, insisting that she would find a Photoshop that could move the cow and reveal her great-grandfather's face. Well, today's Bible passage is about a people who are yearning to see God's face, but there's something in the way. Throughout Israel's history, her people had enjoyed a close personal relationship with the Almighty God, but they also endured periods of great violence and persecution and separation from God. They knew that God had chosen them and set them apart for a reason. God had a plan to deliver them from their suffering and restore the kingdom of Israel, making it a model of justice and prosperity. For hundreds, even thousands of years, they'd been waiting and searching for the coming Messiah, the divine king of Israel. They'd been yearning to see his face. And now through the words of the prophet Isaiah, God is offering to move the cow, so to speak. But the face we see in this passage is not the face we expect to see. In Isaiah chapter 8, the prophet declares that a day is coming when the northern kingdom of Israel will be devastated by the army of Assyria. In verse 17, he claims that because of the people's disobedience, the Lord is hiding his face from them. But here in chapter 9 of Isaiah the tone changes, and God gives the Israelites a glimpse of his future plan for their salvation. See if you recognize these words. A people walking in darkness have seen a great light. On those living in the land of the shadow of death, a light has dawned. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given, and the government will be upon his shoulders. He will reign on David's throne and over his kingdom, establishing and upholding it with justice and righteousness, From that time on and forever, the zeal of the Lord Almighty will accomplish this. Isaiah is reminding the Hebrew people and us that God didn't make them for darkness. What is darkness? It's a world out of balance. Poverty, that's darkness. Preventable disease is darkness. Injustice is darkness. The strong exploiting the weak is darkness. Hopelessness and rebelliousness against God, that's darkness. Mass shootings are darkness. A mass of mass shootings is really dark. And in this darkness, the people began to question God. Even today, we continue to use this imagery. We use such phrases as, it's a dark time, or the dark night of the soul, or the dark side. Or, I'm wandering around in the dark. 
Or by contrast, we might say there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Or I'm beginning to see the light, right? We use these words and phrases because they describe what many of us experience. These common feelings have always been part of the human experience. Our world today has a good bit of darkness in it, in spite of the light which is readily available. Sometimes it happens on a personal level. Many people feel hopeless. They feel despair. Even in this season of the year, which should bring out the best in us, Unfortunately, sometimes the worst comes out, right? You know, it's been years since I've been up to Linville Caverns in the mountains of North Carolina, but I remember that it is so dark in those caves that the fish have evolved to where they don't need eyes. It's so dark that the fish in that cave wouldn't be able to see anything even if they had them. So at one point on the tour of the caverns, our tour guide turned off the lights in the cave. Pitch black. I mean, I couldn't see my hand in front of my face. Usually, when I turn out the lights back home, you know, there's still some faint light coming in the window from somewhere. But not in Linville Caverns. You can't see anything. It's a little freaky. And then in one stroke, I remember our guide lit a match. Not a candle, just a match. And instantly, the darkness was gone. I could see again. The smallest of lights completely overwhelmed the darkness. The light shines in the darkness, says the Gospel of John, and the darkness will not overcome it. Father Samuel Ryan, a Jesuit theologian in India, wrote about the importance of light as a metaphor for what is good in the world. Bishop Peter Story of South Africa, who was one of my professors at Duke Divinity School, quoted Father Ryan during the years he struggled against apartheid. For Bishop Story and the Methodists of South Africa, it came to describe their courageous witness. And the symbol for it was a candle surrounded by barbed wire, which always burns on the communion table at Central Methodist Church in Johannesburg, South Africa. It's a simple statement of light shining in the darkness. From India to South Africa to Wrightsville Beach, here it is. A candlelight is a protest at midnight, says Father Ryan. It's a nonconformist. A candle says to the darkness, I beg to differ. In days of war and torture and terror, we lift up the lamp of justice and peace, which says, I beg to differ. Amid the darkness of bigotry and prejudice, We share a common loaf and lift a common cup and say, we beg to differ. When national priorities reflected in national budgets favor greed instead of those in need, and the vote of just one person makes all the difference, we witness the compassion of Christ and say, we beg to differ. When we feel like we are stumbling in the darkness of gloom and despair, we raise our voices as a protest at midnight, singing joy to the world. The Lord has come. Let earth receive her king. Let every heart prepare him room, and heaven and nature sing. For today we gather as sons and daughters of the light. We gather as a community of hope, a people of peace. We witness to the one who is born to be the light of the world, and in our gathering we are bold to say to the darkness, we beg to differ. The light shines in the darkness, and the darkness will not overcome it. Just a small candlelight, a protest against the darkness of the world, seen through the image of Christmas, darkness turning into light. For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. On a night way back in 1741, composer George Frederick Handel was walking down a dark London street. A series of misfortunes had befallen him, and his mood was every bit as dark as the night. His age had caught up with him, leaving him in poor health and with failing eyesight. He was even partially paralyzed. He had writer's block and was not composing, and since he wasn't composing, he had no income. He felt depressed and despondent, broken in body and in spirit. Cold and despairing, he returned to his run-down little house. 
And in the lamplight, he could barely see that there was a package leaning against the door. Stooping over and ripping open the package, he discovered the text for a new piece of sacred music and a note from a friend asking Handel if he could set the words to music. Handel took the package inside and he lit a lamp to read by. Still disheartened, Handel began to turn clumsily through the pages. And then his weak eyes fell upon a passage that he felt he could identify with. It read, he's despised and rejected, a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. Isaiah 53. Handel understood what the prophet Isaiah was saying. He could identify with these words about Christ. Handel himself felt despised and rejected, a man of sorrows acquainted with grief. And he eagerly read on and found the words that he trusted on the Lord that would deliver him, seeing he delighted in him from Psalm 22. Starting to feel comforted, Handel continued and he wrote, I know that my Redeemer lives. And then he wrote the Hallelujah Chorus. By this time, Handel is rejuvenated. His creative juices are flowing again. Magnificent melodies and harmonizations flowed freely into his head and then onto his manuscript. He worked nonstop, day after day, hardly stopping to eat or sleep. He was overcome by the power of the scriptures and on fire with his unquenchable energy. Handel finished the Messiah in only 24 days. And then he collapsed into his bed for a lengthy and well-deserved rest. Handel himself was a new creation after his experience with Messiah. A different person emerged from the work of this composition. He'd experienced firsthand the light of Christ in his own life. Christ was born anew in Handel's heart as Handel experienced the peace that passes all understanding. Handel's Messiah is an integral part of this season as scripture comes alive through music and the arts. And I would love for you to Pull up the Hallelujah Chorus or For Unto Us a Child is Born on Spotify or YouTube on the way home today. Speaking of the arts, one of my favorite artists is Thomas Kincaid, hailed as the painter of light. He is a committed Christian who gives hope and inspiration through his art. He understands the power of light to transform our world, especially candlelight. And he explains that of all the colors of light, the warmest is the color of candlelight. When Kincaid paints light coming from the windows in his Christmas paintings, he tries to capture the color of candlelight. It is warm and welcoming, an amber glowing. Nothing transforms the feeling of a room the way candlelight does. You know, we're living in a world that often seems so dark. Long shadows extend across our community Shadows that will loom larger unless we all bring our lights from afar and dispel the darkness. One small light can pierce the darkness. And Jesus, who we're celebrating his birth just in a few weeks, tells us that we are the light of the world. Long ago, God said, let there be light, and there was light, and God saw the light, and it was good. And countless generations later, God spoke again through the prophet Isaiah to say, the people who walked in darkness have seen a great light. The first time God spoke to light up the world, the second time God's word came to light up our hearts with the promise of a coming king, a savior. How important it is to have that light within us. When we've got it on the inside, our whole world is a brighter place. I would invite you to bring your light to church each week and then not just brighten the corner where you're worshiping, but also take it back home with you and brighten up the place where you live, the place where you work. You know, in about four months, excuse me, four, I said four months, four weeks, we will gather in this space again for our annual Christmas Eve services. And my favorite part of the service is near the end when we pass the light of Christ from one person to another by lighting each other's candles. But the light, it's unlike any other gift that's given 
Because usually when you give somebody something, then the giver now has less. I've given my thing away. But instead, when you give away light, after the light is shared, both candles glow with equal brightness. The light multiplies exponentially as it's passed down each row. That's what Jesus does for us. As another person believes in Jesus, the light of the world casts out another place of darkness. May we pass that light on this Advent season. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Pray with me. Holy God, in giving us Jesus, you have given us the light of the world. And you have asked us to share that light with a world that is full of darkness. Lord, help us not to be scared of the dark, but to bring Jesus with us to light up the darkness to show what is good and what is evil and help us to walk the path that you have illumined for us. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. What child is this who laid to rest? On Mary's lap is sleeping Whom angels greet with anthems sweet While shepherds watch are keeping This, this is Christ the King Whom shepherds guard and angels sing Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe the son of Mary. Why lies he in such mean a state where ox and ass are feeding? Good Christians fear for sinners hear the silent word is pleading. This, this is Christ the King whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him, Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. So bring him incense, gold and myrrh, come peasant king to own him. The King of kings, salvation rings, let loving hearts enthrone him. This, this is Christ the King, whom shepherds guard and angels sing. Haste, haste to bring him Lord, the babe, the son of Mary. I was an acolyte when I was a kid, and I always thought it was weird that if I was bringing in the light of Christ, that I needed to light two candles. Wouldn't I just need to light one? The two candles represent the two natures of Christ, that he is fully divine and fully human. Um, But it all comes from the same light. And... He shares that with us, and we can share that with others. Notice his light's not diminished, and you know that if I were to give this to someone else, it wouldn't diminish this light. I could give it a thousand times, a million. It would never diminish. I mean, other than the the candle eventually. But that's what God does for us. He continues to shine in our hearts, and he asks us, to spread this good news of Jesus to a world that is hurting, to a world in darkness that needs a light. Go forth in peace. And may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
The communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. May you run and not be weary. May your heart be filled with song. May the love of God continue to give you hope and keep you strong. And may you run and not be weary. May your life be filled with joy. And may the road you travel always lead you home.